Good morning. Man, it's great to see everyone here this morning. Um, I want to do something before we begin. I'm going to ask one of our elders, um, Danny, if he would come up and lead us in a prayer for Miss um, Sharon. Her son um, is getting ready to undergo treatment for stage 4 cancer. She's going to be traveling to New York. And so, Danny, if you would, come and lead us in a prayer for her and her son. Will you bow with me, please? Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. We come with a little bit of a heavy heart, Father. We, we pray especially for our sister Sharon. And I pray, Father, that you would be with her as she travels. We pray, Father, even more for Kevin as he goes through this cancer. We know many people, Father, that have been touched by this. We don't understand why sometimes, Father. But we know, Father, that you are a loving God. We know, Father, that you are omnipresent. We know, Father, that through you all things are possible. We pray, Father, this morning for Kevin. We pray, Father, for the doctors that will be overseeing this. We pray, Father, that you would be with Sharon and give her safe travels and help her, Father, as she deals with this. And we pray, Father, that if it be your will, that you would reach down, that you would touch him, Father, and that, that you would help the doctors and that you would be with this situation. Through it all, Father, we know that we have that home in heaven that you have prepared for us. You told us that you have gone to prepare a place for us. And if you've gone to prepare a place for us, that means you will come back. And we know, Father, that someday that we will be with you. And none of these things will bother us anymore. None of the physical pains and the illnesses that we have. None of the heartache, Father. You will wipe away the last tear. We're so thankful for your son and the blood that he shed for us. And I pray, Father, if it be your will, that you would be with Kevin and that you might take this away from him. I pray these things in your son's holy name and for his sake only. Amen. Thank you, Danny. Miss Sharon, will you, will you raise your hand just so people, those of you who don't know her, uh, make sure she's, she's getting ready to go to New York. And so make sure that you come by and encourage her, lift her up, uh, pray with her. Uh, because she needs your encouragement right now. We're in a series entitled Happily Ever After, and we're talking about marriage. And today we're going to be discussing a key component of marriage, which is commitment. You know, you look around at the world today, and really there's, there's not a whole lot of commitment anymore. I mean, if you get tired of something, I mean, you just switch or you change or, or you trade it in, whatever, you know, you, you let it go and, and you get something new. And I'm afraid that same mentality is even sliding into our marriages today. I don't know if you realize this or not, but there are around 4 million marriages every year. And statistics show that by 15 years... Those marriages, or half of those marriages, have ended in divorce. And here's the thing that really concerns me the most. Many of those marriages that end in divorce are Christians. And so I want to start off by making this statement. And that is, we all need to think about what it means to make a commitment as a Christian. Okay, and, and to help us really think about this, I want us to look at Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, we're going to be looking at verses 4 through 6. Notice what it says, when you make a what, church? When you make a vow or a commitment to God, He says, do not delay in fulfilling it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vows. It is better not to vow than to make a vow and what? 
and not fulfill it. He says, do not let your mouth lead you to sin and do not protest to the temple messenger, my vow was a mistake. Okay, now that last part is very interesting because so oftentimes, and we're going to talk about this as we go through the lesson, but so oftentimes what you'll hear people say today, especially when it comes to that mar their marriage, is man, I have made a mistake. I mean, I, I think that there is one person out there for me, and I just somehow, I made a mistake. I latched on. I made a commitment to the wrong person. And what God is saying here is don't say you've made a mistake. When you make a vow, when you make a commitment to me, He says, I want it to stick. In other words, here's the thing that we need to take away from this as Christian. God takes our vows very seriously. If you have to, write that down. God takes our vows very seriously. Some of you say, well, well Slate, man, I, I, I didn't realize that when I got married. I mean, we were, were so young. Let me tell you, my wife was 19 years old when we got married. I turned 20 five days before we got married. We were extremely young. We had no clue, and, and those of you who know what I'm talking about, you can shake your head. We had no clue what we were getting into, amen? I mean, we had no idea what life was going to be like in this relationship where we were going to be committed to one another, spending the rest of our lives together. We had no idea what that was going to be like. But God calls us to commitment. We're going to talk about commitment this morning, and, and I want you to, to understand, I want to nail this down this morning. God is the source of this commitment, not man. If you go to Genesis chapter 2, basically what you have is the very first wedding, right? Right? You get there, and this is what it says in verse 18. It says, the Lord said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Okay, so, so you've got God. And God creates the entire world. He's, he's putting animals on it. He's, he's, you know, putting trees on it and water and all these things. But He creates man and He says, after all these other things are created, and after all these other things, he said, this is good, this is good, this is good, this is good. He says, there's one thing that's not good. And he says, it's man being alone. And so he said, you know what? I'm going to create a helper for him. I'm going to create Eve, right? But you know what's so fascinating is before God creates Eve, what does he do? He says, Adam, I want you to name all the animals. And so God puts Adam over here and he puts the animals in a line over here and he starts bringing them through. He starts marching the animals through so that Adam can look at all these animals and give them a name. And I've always kind of wondered what that would look like. You're a hippopotamus. Or you look like a giraffe to me. Or, or you look like a, a platypus, you know, or a hyena. You know, it just it, it kind of makes you wonder what, what that was really like as all these animals are coming, coming through. But I think God had a greatest, greater purpose for what He was doing there than just giving these, these animals names. I think what God was doing was God was letting Adam see that all these animals, they weren't suitable mates. I think what God was doing was, was, he, was he was really working on Adam to help him appreciate what was fixing to come about, what he was fixing to create. And so you know what happens next. He gives Adam the first anesthesia, right? He, he puts him to sleep. And then he takes a bone from his rib. To create woman. And, and to me, that's, that's kind of fascinating in and of itself. You know, why didn't He create her from the ground or from the dust like He created Adam? 
And, and I always use this thought. I think there's a lot of similar or uh, symbolism there. I always share this uh, when I'm marrying a couple. But I'll, I'll I'll take note of this and I'll say, you know, God didn't take a bone from man's foot to be under him, or take a bone from his head to be above him. But He took a bone from Adam's side to be near Him, under His arm, to be protected by Him, and near His heart, to be loved by Him. Isn't that beautiful symbolism there? Isn't it, isn't it awesome that, that God created Eve from Adam's, Adam's rib? Well, Adam wakes up. And standing before Him isn't an animal. <laughs> It's this beautiful woman. And she's got this beautiful hair and this beautiful skin. And she is so much different than anything that Adam has ever seen. And so it's like, whoa, man. And that's where she gets the name, woman, right? <laughs> Thank you for laughing. I appreciate that. I thought that was pretty good too. But anyway... God makes a statement, right? Right after this. After He is connected with Eve. After He sees Eve. In verse 24. And by the way, this verse from here on out is going to be used verbatim time and time and time again in God's Word. Verse 24, this is what God says. He says, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and they will become one flesh. And like I said, over and over and over again, we're going to see this verbatim, word for word, God placing that same thing throughout Scripture. In fact, Jesus uses those same words, but I want you to listen to what Jesus adds to that in Matthew chapter 19. And I love this translation. You can read the one behind me, but I really like this one. Jesus says, What God has joined together, let no man separate. Man is going to, to leave his father and mother, and, and the same is true of, of the woman, and they're going to come together, and they're going to be one. I'm uniting them together in this commitment. And he says, what I have joined together, he says, no one is to separate that. And so I want you to see where this source of commitment comes from. It's not from man. This is from God Almighty. Now the world looks at this and says, Whoa, 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 whoa. Are you kidding me? God, don't you understand that there are things that take place many times when there is commitment. And, and we're going to talk about those things, but let me, let me point this out. This is what God intends. In God's will, a marriage involves a commitment from two people to each other for life, but the world begins to say, but hey, when we make a commitment like that, we change. And, and so God, is that really fair? Two people for life? I mean, come on. Why make this kind of commitment? How many of you have, have ever thought that? Or maybe you know someone who has said that to you before. After we got married, my spouse changed. We just went two different directions. You know, we just, we're, we're two different people now. We've, we've, we've changed. I, I, this is not the same person that, that I've married. And so is it really fair to, to have to keep that kind of commitment? The world also says, you know, everybody has the right to repair their mistakes. Like I said in the beginning, there are some people who I've actually talked to who have said, you know, I believe that God has one person out there for me. But I'm here to tell you, Slate, that I made a mistake. I, I thought that I was marrying that one person, but now that I look back, I really see that it was just an infatuation. And, or, or maybe, you know, they say, you know, God has somebody out there for me, but, you know, I didn't wait long enough. And so I just kind of, I, I jumped on the first person that, you know, would have a relation, relationship with me. And so I made a mistake. 
And you know, when we make a mistake in the world, you know, if we buy a, a lemon, if we buy a car that, you know, just doesn't work very well, what do we do? Well, we just trade it in for another one. Or, or if we make a mistake in the job that, that we chose, what, what do we do? Well, we go out and, and we, find, uh, another, we find another job. And, and it's like one individual said, Margaret Mead, she asked this question, if past mistakes are to be repairable in every other field, why should marriage be the exception? And so why should I keep a commitment like that? I mean, come on, I made a mistake. And then thirdly, everybody has the right to stop pointless pain, right? I mean, Slay, you don't understand. All we do is fight. We are at each other's throats from the time we get up in the morning till the time we go to bed. We fight, fight, fight. All, all that takes place is arguing. Nothing gets accomplished. I mean, it's, it's just absolutely terrible. It's a lost cause that we are fighting for here. And so why not put an end to the pointless pain? You know, there are a lot of people who are no longer marrying because of this. Cohabitation is on the rise. Because kids, our generation, are now looking at their parents and they're saying, I don't want to go through that. I, I, I don't want to experience the same thing they went through. I, I don't want to... I, I, I don't want my family to end in divorce. I, I don't want to go through all those things. But God says there's a purpose. There's a purpose. There's a rhyme. There's a reason for the commitment that I am asking you to make. And here's the first. We're going we're gonna to look at three very quickly. First of all, love demands it. You know, the Bible calls us to love unconditionally. What does that mean? No strings attached, right? We looked at the word agape last week in the Greek, and that's the kind of love that God is calling us to have as, as couples, is this unconditional, no strings attached kind of love. Because that's the kind of love that the Lord had for us, right? I mean, those verses that I read right before we, we took the Lord's Supper, you know, here was, was Jesus, and He is dying on the cross. He let people take Him, physically abuse Him, mock Him, spit on Him, punch Him in the face, but yet Jesus went to the cross anyway. In fact, he even looked upon those who were doing those things and he said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Love, true love, demands a commitment. No strings attached. I'm not bailing. It, it doesn't matter. I'm not walking away from this because I love you. And as parents, we should understand this, right? Right? You know, we make a commitment to our children. And what happens over time, our children change. And over time, you know, our, our children, they hurt us and, and they disappoint us. But you know what? Very seldom do you ever hear a parent who will say, well, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to unparent you. I'm separating from you. No, what does a parent do? I love you anyway. And that's what commitment is. That's what commitment is all about. As parents, we're committed. We will commit to our kids, but we've also got to commit to our spouse. I'm in this. And I'm not going anywhere. Because I love you. But I think another reason why commitment was so important to guys is because the children need it. 
You know, our, our children don't ask to be a part of the family that they are in. They're just, they're, they're grafted into it, right? They, they don't have a choice in that. And they get anxious if they're suspicious of their parents separating or getting a divorce. Archibald Hart in his book, The Children of Divorce, says that when parents divorce, the children experience all kind of pains. There's grief like someone has died. There's conflict. They feel like they have to choose sides. They feel guilt like it's their fault. There's depression. There's anxiety. And one of the things that I've noticed is that divorce is a tremendous blow not only to children when they're small, but to children when they even get older. I've, I've talked to people who are in their 30s and 40s and their parents have been together for many, many years, but in their old age they decide, you know, we're, we're just sick of each other. We're ending it in a divorce. And man, these kids in their 30s, 40s, they will tell you, I am devastated. I am heartbroken. No child who, is, who experiences that ever forgets it. I think that's why God says in Malachi chapter 2, verses 15 through 16, and again, this is not me speaking. Has not the Lord made them one? In flesh and spirit they are His. And, and why one? He says, because He was seeking what, church? Godly offspring. That's, you see the, the purpose of the commitment there. I want you guys to be one. I want you to be committed to one another because I'm wanting godly offspring. And then he goes on to say, he says, So guard yourself in your spirit and do not break faith with the wife of your youth. And then I'm just going to let you yourself read this last part right here. What does he say, church? Hey, divorce. And because God hates divorce, really, we should hate it too. And one of the reasons we should hate it so badly is because of what it does to our kids. But then number three is, is this. God calls us to commitment because... It represents our, our Christian testimony, right? The, the world needs to see this type of commitment. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31, Paul, he says, This reason a man will leave his father and mother, here we go again, same thing, back at Genesis chapter 2, and be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. But then notice what Paul tacks onto that in verses 32 through 33. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and what? And the church. In other words, as Paul is talking about marriage, He's also talking about Christ and, and His body, His church. Because here's the thing. A Christian marriage is a symbol to the world of the love that Jesus has for the lost. I mean, you talk about unconditional commitment. Jesus made it. Even though we change, He loves us. Even though we're sinners, He died for us. Even though we rebel against Him, He reaches out to us. And here's the thing, if we, if we don't keep that commitment, if we don't stay with our vows, it does terrible damage to the reputation of the church. But if we see it through, then the world is impressed and they begin to ask questions. How did you do it? And that's our, that's our opportunity to witness and to testify of Christ. Philippians 4, 13, through Christ, I can do anything. Christ empowers me. He empowers my family. That's why when I'm talking about marriage and premarital counseling, I tell our couples, listen, you've got to make God the foundation of your home. Because God ordained marriage, He's got it all figured out, and so we just need to live like He would have us to live and trust Him to bless the rest. And it's amazing what happens when we do things God's way. 
Heard about a professor who was once approached by a student with a, with a problem. But before they got to the problem, the, the student and the professor, they just started, started small talking. Finally, um, the professor um, said, so, so what's your problem? And the young man said, well, don't worry about it. He said, I, I, I guess I, I really don't need to even talk about it. And he said, I don't understand. And the student said, well, he said, I just needed the association of a triumphant spirit. And you know what? The world probably doesn't need a bunch of books or even sermons on marriage. What our world needs is to see some triumphant marriages. Some marriages that are, are great. Some marriages that have held together through thick and thin. Some marriages that are filled with, with joy. Some marriages that are not just good, they're, they're great. And I believe we can have that. But I think it starts with commitment. I, I want us to close out this morning by doing something a little different. I, I'm going to put up on the screen this morning the commitment. Those of you who are married this morning, whether it's through a, a preacher, justice of the peace, whatever, more than likely most of you gave vows at least similar to this. And we're just going to look at the commitment that we made. I slate, take you, Julie Fears, to be my wedded wife. I slate, take you, Julie Fears. And, and what we're saying when we make that first statement out of the gate is, guess what? I'm going to take you as you are. I think so oftentimes what we have in mind before we get married is, okay, when we get married, man, I'm going to change you. And you laugh because you know it just doesn't work that way, right? Right? I heard one lady at Robert's sale, she said this all the time, especially when talking about marriage. She would say, you cannot be your spouse's Holy Spirit. That's the Spirit's job. You can't change your spouse. And so when you make that commitment, what you are saying is, I'm accepting you as you are. Through the good and through the bad. And, and some of you know that even the good that we all possess can eventually in marriage become bad. For example, I married Julie. One of the things I loved about my wife is she is a clean freak like me. And uh, I, I mean, I love that. She keeps the house spotless. But there are times where we'll get done eating dinner and I'll say, Hey honey, I'll say, let's go into the living room and, and let's watch a movie. Or, or let's go out and, and do something. And she'll say, okay. She says, first of all, we're going to clean the, the kitchen. And I'm like, but honey, we can do that when we get back. No, I want it clean now because what's going to happen when you guys get back I'm going to be the only one standing in the kitchen. Amen. And I'm like, I slate, take you, Julie Fears, as my lawfully wedded wife, right? But, but you know, the, there, there's good things and there's bad things, and even the good things can be bad at times, but I'm accepting you. I'm accepting you as you are to have. This is very important. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 4 through 5. We need to understand when we get married, our bodies belong to our mate. The wife's body does not belong to her alone, but also to her husband. In the same way, the husband's body does not belong to him alone, but also to his wife. And so do not depre deprive each other except by mutual consent. He's talking about intimacy here between a husband and a wife. Don't deprive each other of this, but devote yourselves to prayer. And he talks about how there may be times such as this where you are, you've decided, you've, you've got this mutual consent to devote your time to prayer. But then he says, come back together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. In other words, intimacy is never to be used as punishment or a reward. When you say, I commit to you, what I'm saying to you is, my body is yours, your body is mine. To have. 
we belong to each other. Because if we do things any different than that, he tells us Satan can slide in. And he can cause us to put our gaze upon other people. And God wants that commitment between the husband and the wife. To have, to hold. We need to love and we need to cherish each other, but we need that touch to communicate the love that we have for each other. One of the things that I do when couples come to me that are struggling in their marriages, after, the, after we get done talking, I'll have the couple stand up and I'll say, now before you leave, I want you to just hold each other. And usually what happens when they do, both of them just break out crying. Because you see, the love that they were trying to communicate with each other, it, it, was, it, it was missing. It, it wasn't getting to the other person's heart. But when they touched, when they held each other, they began to feel that love again. To have to hold from this day forward. You hear couples say from time to time, well, you know... We went through the marriage ceremony and spent a lot of money, spent a lot of time, but things just don't seem different. I mean, I don't feel married. Let me tell you something. From this day forward, you are married and things will be very different. In fact, from this day forward, you better remember your anniversary when it comes around or you're going to have some big problems. But to have, to hold from this day forward, for better or for worse. And believe you me, there's going to be some, some good times, but you have to understand there's going to be some bad times. He says, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. And he's talking about some of those bad times that we may experience, right? There may be times where we have financial problems. There may be times when, when we have issues of, of health. There may be times when our spouse's attitude, at least from our perspective, is not what it should be. And we have to be very careful that we don't start think, thinking to ourselves, well, if something don't change, I'm getting out. We've got to start saying to ourselves, listen, for better or for worse... I'm staying in. I'm, I'm holding on to this commitment. You know, speaking of for better or worse, I was talking to Michelle Hall this week, and she's always sharing with me just tidbits of wisdom. And she says this is what her mother told her a long time ago. She says, whatever you're looking for, take it in there. If you want joy in your marriage, take joy into your marriage. You want love in your marriage? Take love into your marriage. Whatever you're looking for, no matter what's going on, for better or worse, you, you take it in there. You decide, I'm committing and I'm going to bring this into our marriage. Think about James Hammond Tree, a guy from Robert Still, Stay with me. We're almost out of time, I know. James Hammond Tree was married. His wife had chronic MS. For 15 years, she was in an electric wheelchair, and she was basically paralyzed from the waist down. Later on, it eventually took away her hands, it took away her, her arms, and then after 10 more years, she passed away basically bedridden with James staying on her side, taking care of her every step of the way, and I asked him about that. I said, how did you do it? And he looked at me with tears in his eyes and he said, you just have to bloom where you're planted. There are going to be times where things are not going to be good, but you have to bloom where you're planted. You have to commit. You have to say, I'm in this. To love and to cherish. Read 1 Corinthians 13. If you're struggling in your marriage, I would challenge both of you in the marriage to read 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7 every single day. Check it out. See what love is all about because you committed to love and to cherish your spouse. And it's not this Hollywood love that you see on TV, it's this unconditional agape love that God is calling us to in our marriage 
marriages. And here's the thing, until death do us part. That's the commitment we made. In other words, when we marry, we are making a commitment to be faithful until we die. And that's an essential ingredient if we want a happy marriage. Deciding, you know what, I'm making this commitment and I'm not looking back. No more comparing, no more looking over my shoulder. No more thinking, well if things don't get better, I'm getting out. Because those things so disharmony, those things so distrust in our relationships, in our marriages, we have to decide... I'm committed. I'm committed. Let me say this and we're done. God has not called you to be happy. He's called you to be obedient to Him. And when you are obedient to Him, you will begin to be ultimately fulfilled and blessed. Someone asked me the other day, they said, Slate, is it hard preaching on marriage knowing that there are folks sitting out in the audience who, who have gone through divorce? And, and I told them, I said, absolutely. I'm not trying to, to hurt anyone or to cause any more pain than what you've already been through. But I think if I were to ask those same people, would you want others going through that? They would stand up here and they would testify, absolutely not. You say whatever you can to help them to realize the commitment that they are making or have already made. And the beautiful part is, as we stay committed, and we talked about this last Sunday night, we begin to learn each other. And we begin to grow. And something begins to happen within our relationship that God has called us to to where our marriage becomes blessed if we'll put it into His hands. Let's pray. God, we just praise You so much for being such an amazing God. Thank You for Your unconditional love. Father, help us. Help us to, to put ourselves in a position to where we can do that. I, I realize that there's probably not anything I can say this morning that's going to make someone do that. And so, Father, just help us to put ourselves in the right position to act and to do as You would have us to do and to treat our spouse the way You would have us to treat them. And, and Father, we just trust You that the good feelings are going to come when we, when we do what You say. And that You will truly bless our marriage. But Father, help us to trust You, to know You've got a perfect will and, and plan. Help us to, to stay committed to work through those good times and bad times. Father, for those who have gone through this, I am so sorry. And I lift them up before You right now. I pray that You will heal broken hearts. And Father, we know that, that You have the power to, to heal. And, and Father, we just we pray healing over those who may be hurting right now. But Father, for those who are, are struggling in their relationship, Father, please bring healing, forgiveness, and mending to them as well. And Father, we just pray all these things in Your Son Jesus' name. Amen. We want to encourage you today, um, one of our elders will come forward. If you need prayers, maybe you're hurting, maybe your heart's broken. And uh, one of our elders will come forward and they would love to pray with you. We have a room in the back to our right um, where if, if there's something you need prayers for or encouragement about, uh, they'll be back there to do that with you. Um, maybe that there are some of you today that are not Christians. And uh, we would love to tell you about Jesus and His unconditional love for you and what He's done for all of us so that we could be saved, so that we could spend eternity with Him. But if you have a need, won't you come as together we stand and sing.